NASA logo appears. Over the background of a circular star field, a spacecraft leaves a trail as it orbits a red wing and letters that spell NASA. Now a satellite dish is silhouetted against an orange sunset. Above, the word destination appears. Light flashes and the scene changes. An animated globe spins. Another flash and an orange sky is streaked with cumulus in motion. Another word appears. Tomorrow. An animated planet spins. Another flash and a jet races through the blue sky. The blue sky turns to a black star field. A title appears. NASA Destination Tomorrow, bringing the future into focus. Coming up on this edition of Destination Tomorrow, we take a look at the future of aeronautics at NASA. We'll find out about a new governmental and commercial partnership that will help guide the transformation into the next generation air system. We will also find out about a unique airplane that may soon be flying on Mars. And we take a look back at several of NASA's aeronautic success stories. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Now a woman with long brown hair, host Kara O'Brien, stands before an airplane exhibit in an aeronautical museum. Hello everyone, I'm Kara O'Brien and welcome to this edition of Destination Tomorrow. On this episode, we'll be focusing on the role NASA plays in aeronautics research. NASA has a long and rich history of pioneering achievements. But if you ask almost anyone what NASA's mission is, virtually everyone would say something related to space. Although that's true to a certain extent, NASA is much more than just the nation's space agency. Aeronautics is also a major area of study for NASA. Although NASA's work in space has received a great deal of attention, less is known about the aeronautics research it's performed. This research has dramatically improved every aspect of air travel as we know it, from the preeminence of American military air power over the world's battlefields to the safety and reliability of general aviation and commercial passenger flights of today. Although aeronautics research is considered a mature science, there is still a great need to continue researching and developing flight for the 21st century. Important roles in aviation safety and security, modernization of the national airspace, and developments in revolutionary new vehicles are just a few areas that will undoubtedly need to be addressed in the coming years. The role for aeronautics research is particularly important when you consider that the number of passengers is expected to double in 10 years and triple in 20 years to 1.8 billion passengers. These numbers are daunting considering today's aviation system often shows signs of gridlock. Congested airports, flight delays, and unreliable service have unfortunately become commonplace. But a unique partnership between government and industry hopes to change the current situation, making air travel for the 21st century much easier, safer, and more reliable. Here's Johnny Alonzo to find out more. A title reads behind the scenes, then old footage shows air travel. The landscape of air travel has changed dramatically since the first scheduled commercial flight took off in January of 1914. In that first year of planned flights, a whopping 1,205 passengers climbed aboard commercial aircraft. Americans soon fell in love with the idea of air travel, leading to a boom in the numbers of commercial flights. From 3 million in 1940 to 55 million in 1956, to well over 600 million today. And this number is only expected to increase in the next decade. By some estimates, there could be over one billion passengers in the air in the very near future. But with this increased number of flights, pressure is beginning to build on our already overburdened air infrastructure. Long lines, delayed flights, safety concerns, and a host of other issues have changed the once glamorous dream of flight into a nightmare for many flyers. With this increased number of passenger flights crowding into an already clogged airspace, it's plain to see that today's aviation system cannot meet 21st century needs. To address this problem, a unique governmental and commercial plan is being developed to create the Next Generation Air Transportation System, or NGATS. Designed by the Joint Planning and Development Office, or JPDO, this collaborative team has developed a multi-stage approach to transform the ailing aviation system. To help us understand what the JPDO hopes to accomplish, I spoke with Dr. Sherry Borner at the National Air and Space Museum's Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center near Washington Dulles International Airport to find out more. Well, the NGATS is the next generation air transportation system. It's our vision for how the future of aviation and, and the delivery of aviation services in the country will be. So it includes everything from the changes in the airplanes that you see around you here, sure. the way that air traffic control will be handled, even the way passengers will be processed in terminals and the kind of information that will be available to them while they're waiting for their flights or trying to find their baggage. The people who are involved in the joint planning and development office are doing their best 
to make the experience of actually flying pleasant. But not only that, they want to make it possible for many, many more people to take advantage of the system. We really a web address want the system appears, to be very HTTP predictable and reliable because it is the backbone of so much of what the country does. The aviation system really contributes to every part of American life, so it shouldn't be a pain in, in, in that way. It should be something that's really enhancing. Um, so we're trying to deal with the airport problem, we're trying to deal with the throughput problem, but we're also trying to deal with the problems that aviation causes as a result of you know, emissions and noise. So a lot of NASA's research is actually aimed at making engines more efficient so they make fewer pollutants and they're less damaging and the noise footprint from the um, aircraft is minimized so people can live near the airport like they do here at Dulles. The final thing is that we want to be able to accommodate anybody's way of doing business or wanting to use the system. So that means we have to have all kinds of partners because they need to work together. They all affect the aviation system. So the FAA and NASA are involved, but also the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Commerce, and even the Department of Defense. So what's the problem with today's system? Well, it's not that the system has problems. In fact, it's that the system is very good, and people want to use the system so much that we're running out of capacity. So if we keep doing things the way we do them now, which are very safe, we will not be able to continue to grow at the rate that people want us to. And we would like to be able to give everybody the opportunity to fly the way that they do now. If they want to go home for Thanksgiving and they want to take 25 people with them, they should be able to do it. So we have to change. When do you think this change will occur? Oh, wow. Things are changing right now. Um, the controllers, a large number of them are near retirement. So the way that the controllers do their jobs is going to change very, very soon. In addition to that, there's a movement afoot to change the way that we handle fuel burn and um, emissions so that we'll be able to operate in a lot of smaller airports, make a lot less noise. So if, if you looked at the changes that will happen, they will be continuous between now and 2025. All the partners in the JPDO want this system to be different, and this An is the perfect time An animation shows a web of intersecting flight paths. So many different things are going to happen anyway, that this is the moment to make the system exactly the way we would like it to be instead of putting in a patch here and there to make it go along five or six more years. So everybody in the JPDO has really put their hearts into developing the best approach so that we can actually deliver the goods at the end of the day. I'll be back later in the show to discuss the historic and revolutionary flight of the X-43 aircraft. But before that, did you know that in the early days of flight, there was no radio communication between aircraft and the ground? In fact, one of the first commercial airlines, the Aeromarine Flying Boat, used homing pigeons to relay messages to the ground from 1920 to 1923. With a pigeon coop attached to the wing, an intrepid Aeromarine employee would pull one of the birds from the coop, wrap a message on its leg, then throw it out of the plane. This technique was only marginally successful due to the fact that many of the pigeons were eaten by hawks on their way back to the home base. This practice was stopped in 1923 when radios were added to the planes, making the pigeons obsolete. Black and white footage gives way to text. Did you know? Now Kara. In recent years, Mars has been in the forefront of scientific study. With NASA's new goal to have human crews land on Mars in the near future, there has been a big push to learn more about the red planet. Although our current rovers, landers, and satellites have provided a wealth of information about Mars, huge gaps in our knowledge still exist. In an effort to help bridge this gap, NASA planners are discussing new missions that can be used to help prepare for human exploration there. One mission currently under review is an aerial survey of Mars using a rocket-powered airplane. This type of mission would give scientists a detailed look at Mars, which is not currently available using our existing rovers and satellites. Jennifer Pulley finds out more. The title reads Tech Watch, then in space, a planet with a pink hue. Perhaps the most studied planet in our solar system other than Earth is Mars. Since the 1960s, NASA scientists have been sending robotic missions there that have helped us better understand the red planet. Now, these missions provided a great wealth of information about Mars, but they've had their limitations. Martian orbital satellites have given us a good overview of Mars, but have not been able to provide us with all of the detailed information that scientists need. Other missions, such as the Viking landers and the Mars Exploration Rover missions, have also been very valuable, but have only been able to provide us with information from a very small section of the planet. These limitations reduce the amount of scientific information needed by NASA researchers to plan for long-term robotic and human missions to Mars. To help bridge this gap, 
Many believe that new missions need to be planned that can gather important information over long distances while also remaining close to the ground. One mission currently being discussed is a Mars airplane called the Aerial Regional Scale Environmental Survey of Mars, or ARIES for short. Now, this rocket-powered aircraft would be able to take important measurements of the Martian surface and atmosphere, which have previously proven to be elusive. To help us better understand how this aircraft would work, I spoke with Dr. Joel Levine at NASA A man with sandy hair and glasses. Ares is an airplane that will fly about a mile above the surface of Mars and will travel for hundreds to thousands of miles. It's designed to fly through the atmosphere of Mars and obtain measurements of the surface, the atmosphere, and climate of Mars that could not be obtained any other way. Up to now, we've put orbiters around Mars and we've put landers and rovers around Mars. Orbiters circle a planet and they make continuous measurements of the whole planet, but they don't have very good spatial resolution. What that means is if there were a football field on Mars, we probably wouldn't see it from orbit because they're 250 miles above the planet. On the other hand, landers and rovers are on the surface. They count every rock and every stone on the surface. Ares will be an intermediate platform. It will allow us for the first time to combine the measurements made from orbiters with the measurements made from landers. Ares is not a small airplane. Ares is like a Cessna. It has a wingspan of 22 feet and it's 16 feet long. Wings and of an animated because airplane it's so fold. big, we have to fold Ares up. We fold the tail over the body, we fold the wings under the plane and we put Ares in an aeroshell. The aeroshell enters the atmosphere of Mars, traveling 17,000 miles an hour. Then Ares pops out of the aeroshell and uh, unfolds and begins its flight. Dr. Levine, what will Ares be able to tell us about Mars that we don't already know? Another very interesting thing an airplane can do that an orbiter can't do is sample the atmosphere from within the atmosphere. We call that in situ sampling. And the airplane will carry instrumentation that will actually bring samples of the Mars atmosphere in the airplane where we analyze it with special chemical instrumentation. And one of the things that we can look for, and one of the things we plan to look for, are certain gases in the atmosphere of Mars that are only produced by biological activity. Recent observations from the Mars Express orbital satellite have detected chemical signatures that show the presence of methane gas on Mars. The discovery of methane is important because it's known that 99.9% .9 of all methane found in our Earth's atmosphere is produced by living organisms. The positive detection of methane on Mars gives us a great deal of hope that life does in fact exist there. But the satellite observations that took these measurements can only see a very broad section of Mars and are not able to pinpoint the source of the methane. In an animation, Ares soars, Ares dragging an open parachute. In. It would be able to travel to a promising spot and fly low enough to pinpoint the source of the methane. Once the methane source is pinpointed, the instruments aboard Ares would be able to determine if the methane is in fact a signature of life. This is very important because the measurements returned from Ares could definitively prove the existence of life on another world. Now this is an unmanned aircraft, right? So what type of instruments will be on board Ares? Right now, if we had to decide on the science payload, we would pick an instrument that analyzes the atmosphere. We would also have an instrument which would look at the ground of Mars as we fly over, and it will measure the mineralogy and chemical composition of the ground. We'll also study magnetism in the crust of Mars. And one of the most exciting instruments on the airplane is not really a scientific instrument. It's a video camera. The video camera will be in the tail of the plane. As we fly, the airplane will be in the foreground, and in the background, you'll see the Mars surface as we fly over. What better way than to bring the public, to bring the world with us as we fly through the atmosphere of Mars? A we web address appears, we http colon slash slash destination dot with our dot NASA of dot Ares gov. On Mars. So how will you control Ares from the Earth? Will it be done remotely? We're not going to control Ares remotely because the time it takes for a radio signal to go from Earth to Mars or Mars to Earth can be 15 minutes to 30 minutes because of the distance involved. We will pre-program Ares. 
And if something happens during the one-year flight to Mars, we can alter the computer program. We can transmit uh, new instructions to the airplane in the spacecraft as it's flying to Mars. If Ares is going to be flying in the Martian atmosphere, how do you test it here on Earth? The atmosphere of Mars is very, very thin. It's about 1% of the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, near the surface of Mars, the atmosphere is like the Earth's atmosphere at 100,000 feet. This presents a very interesting problem because as you know,